Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 37 tonight. Psalm number 37. <clears throat> I think about that song, Who Am I? I'm reminded of a conversation I had during the 2016 election cycle with Brother Mike Thomas, and I teasingly said to Brother Mike, I said, Brother Mike, you worth as much as Donald Trump? He said, nope, but I was worth dying for. And I thought, that's good, brother. I think about that whenever I hear songs like that. He, I, he was worth dying for, so was I, thank God. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is a psalm of David. It says it there just before verse number one. David, the Bible says, is a sweet psalmist of Israel. And David brings up in this psalm a question that has pondered people throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, probably since the beginning of time. David sort of addresses the same question 3,000 years ago, so you know it's been in the hearts of human beings for a long, long time. And the question has been a problem for a great many people of faith. The question goes unanswered to a lot of people, and unfortunately, because it goes unanswered to a lot of people, countless people have gotten out of church and turned their back on God, gone to a sinful, backslidden lifestyle because they don't understand the answer to this question. This question, not only did David ponder this, but David's number one music man, a man by the name of Asaph, questioned this. And Asaph's psalm is found in Psalm 73. We, we're not going to look at that tonight. But the background to this psalm, Psalm 37, is basically David pondering out loud the thought of why does it seem as though wicked people prosper and the godly people sometimes have the greatest hardships. Now, we've heard that a thousand times in the opposite direction. We have, in our day and age, the opposite question of, you've heard it before, why do bad things happen to, finish it for me, good people? It's actually the same question, just asked in reverse. And so David addresses this. He basically wants to know why does it seem like wicked people prosper and godly people are persecuted in this life. We understand that the book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. And you kind of wonder, did David have a copy of the book of Job and was thumbing through it or finished it or just recently read it? Obviously, in David's time, if they had the book of Job, it would have been considered inspired scripture, just like Peter and Paul had discussed things and uh, Peter refers to Paul's writings as scripture, and so if it happened in the New Testament days, it probably happened in Old Testament days that one man might have had another man's writings and recognized them as inspired scripture. So you wonder if David had a book, a copy of the book of Job, and Job obviously was the single greatest man on planet earth in his day, and he faced, Job faced probably the greatest persecution of any man in history. Think about this. Job himself faced one-on-one -on -one satanic persecution. You and I have faced evil. Nobody in here has faced direct one-on-one -on -one satanic persecution. We might have faced demonic persecution. We've never faced satanic persecution. That is what Job himself faced. His persecution was truly unique in history. So maybe David flips through, thumbs through, finishes the book of Job, and just asks the question, hey, why did all that happen? You know, there's, there's a pain in this world that just doesn't go away with a wave of a magic wand. There are certain hardships in this world that, quite frankly, must be dealt with, and a hug from your mom just won't make them go away. There are certain lessons that God wants to teach you and me and unless we're willing to go through the fire, you simply won't learn them. I want to begin tonight's message and just make sure that as we read Psalm 37, we have the view of God that David had. You see, David had a correct view of God. He knew who God was. Sometimes when we read our Bible, in the back of our mind, we don't have a right view of God. And that causes us not to get everything from Scripture that God really wants us to have. Let me ask you a question. How do the heathen view God, the unsaved heathen of the world? How do they view their own false God, their, their small G God, if you will? 
You study the heathen of this world and how they view their false god, you will find that the heathen of this world view their false god as mean and vindictive. That's how the heathen, by and large, view their god. That's one reason they're always trying to, in vain to please their false god. And we don't serve a false god. We serve the true and living god. But here's the problem. If you're unsaved, if you are backslidden, if you're living a carnal Christian life, you can fall into the trap of viewing the true and living God in the same manner that the heathen view their false God. You can view our true and living God as mean and vindictive. And so that when you read the scriptures, not really getting everything from the scriptures that, you, that God wants to give you because you have a false view of God. By the way, I think all of us from time to time go in and out of this mindset where we sometimes struggle with God, hand, how, how he handles things, how he handled our past, whatever it might be. I just want us to make sure that as we read Psalm 37, we have the view of God that David did, which if you study scripture, anybody, even Old Testament saints, anybody that knew God well, they called God good, merciful, kind, loving. I, I mean, God, listen, the God of the Old Testament, who, by the way, was Jesus Christ, was just as gracious as the God of the New Testament. It's one God. He's a gracious, loving God, and that's exactly the God that David knew, and that's exactly how David writes this psalm. It is a psalm written from the perspective of a good man, a godly man, maybe the godliest man that ever lived, certainly one of the godliest men that have ever lived, and that's the perspective that, that David writes this psalm. It's not written by an angry, disgruntled believer. It's not written by an, a, a backslidden man. This is written by one of the godliest men to have ever breathed God's air. And Psalm 37 is one of the many places where God gives us sort of a, a game plan, if you will, to a blessed life. Now, his game plan laid out here in Psalm 37 is not the game plan to an easy life. It is the game plan for a blessed life. Job did not have an easy life. But in the end, Job had a blessed life. Thousands of years later, we still talk about that man. He was a blessed man. Let's read Psalm 37, just the first, uh, probably fourth of it. Psalm 37, the Bible says in verse 1, Fret not thyself. Because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. So the first portion of Psalm 37 gives us a recipe. Notice verse 1. The Bible says, fret, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Don't fret. You say, what's fret? fret? Fretting is an interesting word. If you look it up in the Bible, the first, por uh, the first references to fret or fretting are actually found in the book of Leviticus of all places. It speaks of a fretting leprosy. You say, what's that mean? Leprosy was a disease that would literally eat away at you. Think about this. It was a fretting leprosy. Leprosy. Fretting is something that eats away at you. In this context, fret simply means to be grieved, worry, displeased, troubled, discouraged, depressed. But it's a special kind of grief, think about this, that eats away at you. And I think all of us understand this type of worry. It's a fretting that just consumes us inside. It's a, it's a worry that won't leave us. Just like leprosy would eat away at a person's flesh, a certain type of worry or grief or trouble that eats away at you is when you're fretting. And the Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. According to 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah's adversary 
provoked her sore in an attempt to, the Bible says, make her fret. Which is interesting because that implies that somebody else can push you into the direction of fretting. Somebody can push, think about this, somebody can push you toward fretting. But according to verse 1, who ultimately causes you to fret? Fret not what? Thyself. And just so that God is very clear, look at verse uh, 7. Rest patiently in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself. Notice verse uh, 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself. People can push you in the direction of fretting, but you are ultimately the one that allows yourself to fret with that worry, that anxiousness, that anxiety that eats away at you. That's what it does. Keep your hand here and go up to Proverbs 24 because he says it one more time. Even if you just looked at all the references where somebody frets, what you will find is four references to the exact phrase, fret not thyself. This one in Proverbs 24 is the fourth one. Three are there in verse, I'm sorry, 30 in Psalm 37. This here is the fourth one. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 19, first three words, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. You can go back to Psalm 37. So four separate distinct times, God tells us not to fret. Understand something. President Biden is not making you fret. Amen. Vice President Harris is not making you fret. Your wife is not making, now she can push you in that direction. She's not making you fret. Your husband is not making you fret. Mom, your kids are not making you fret. You are fretting because it's a, it, it, it is an unconscious decision you're making when you purposely don't do the recipe that we're going to get to a little later. Fretting will eat away at you. Think about this. To fret is the opposite of trust. If you are currently fretting, think about this. Not only are you worrying, not only is that worry eating away at you, it is actually the opposite of trusting God. Now let's take this to its natural conclusion. If you're fretting, you're not trusting God, which means what you are saying through your spirit is that you are saying God is untrustworthy. God, think about this, you're saying through your fretting, God is not worthy to be trusted. I can't even say it without chuckling at the thought, but that is the end result of fretting. Your fretting is saying, God, you're not worthy to be trusted in this situation. I have to, I have, to have control over this. And your fretting is indirectly setting you up as somebody that can handle the situation. And you've already proven through your fretting through the years that you can't handle the situation, which was why Peter says, cast thy cares upon the Lord. It does nothing but eat away at us, this fretting. Well, I'm not saying that, you know, Brother Joe, I, I don't, you know, the Lord's not trustworthy. Of course you wouldn't say that out loud, but that is what your fretting does. That is the end result, the end conclusion of your fretting is you're saying God's not trustworthy and he's not worthy to be trusted. See, some of you fret about the political future of America. By the way, that's why you honestly, in all seriousness, should take a break from conservative political talk. You should take a break from Fox News. And I'll explain to you why. It's very simple. They can be correct technically, but it causes people to fret. Listen, if we could handle President Roosevelt, President Obama, I'm sure we can handle President Biden. It's not worth fretting about. See, the silence causes me to think, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here that didn't like that. Turn the radio off. It's doing nothing but causing you to fret. That's what's happening. You're welcome. Some of you fret about the racial issues in America, which is why you should take a break from Facebook and social media. I mean, just turn it off. Or give yourself a little window of some sort, daily or weekly, where you can just binge on that stuff and whatever, fret all you want, but good night, turn the stuff off. It's causing you nothing but to fret and to eat away at yourself. By the way, teens and young adults, that, this is why you struggle with your image, because you do nothing but spend time on social media. 
You do nothing but spend time on. I, a good night. I see teenagers all the time. If they're not speaking to each other, they have to have their phone out. Yeah. Like, put it away. You don't have to Snapchat that. Get over it. You're, that, that idea is causing you to fret. Is that sin in and of itself to send that text or that picture? Maybe not. But the overarching theme is that that idea is causing you to fret. It's eating away at you. See, the worry you walk around with, the grief that you walk around with, the anxiety, the discouragement, the depression, it's all proof that you're fretting. Mark it down. If you're fretting, if you're discouraged, troubled, depressed, or whatever word you want to pick, you mark it down. You do not have your eyes on Jesus Christ in the Bible. Instead, you have your eyes on this world and the problems of this world. Amen. Simply think about Peter. When he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid thou come to me, Jesus said, come. What did Peter do? He stepped out of the boat. Jesus is walking on the water. Peter stepped out of the boat. And when his eyes were on the Lord, talk to me, class, what did he do? Walked on water. But the Bible says when he saw the wind boisterous, what happened? He began to sink. The ex that is an exact illustration of what fretting does, of discouragement, of depression, of anxiety, Listen, I'm not saying some people might not need medication for that, but listen, God gives us an outline right here to help us with our discouragement, our depression, our anxiety, whatever it might be. It's right here in Psalm 37. Amen. Keep your hand here and turn up to Philippians chapter 4. Your fretting will be directly connected to whatever you have your eyes on. When Peter had his eyes on the Lord... When Peter had his eyes on the word of God, because Jesus said, come, man, he was good. But the moment he took his eyes off the Lord, he got discouraged, despondent, began to sink. Notice what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4. It's a very famous verse. The Bible says in verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God. Listen, right here, this is a guy that's not fretting right here in this verse. He is not fretting. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He's saying the same thing. Don't fret. You can go back to Psalm 37. You say, why should I not fret? Let's go to the next verse, verse 2. Don't fret because of evildoers from verse 1. Why? Verse 2, they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. Why should I not fret about what's going on around me? Listen, one day God is going to straighten all of this out. I, it's literally just like you walk out on a spring morning and with a powerful, sharp, cold steel lawnmower blade, you begin to cut through the weak and helpless grass. Listen, God's cold sickle of judgment is coming on this world of evildoers. That is what he's saying there. Verse 2, they shall soon be cut down. Listen, even if a man lives 90 years, what is that to God? It is nothing. 90 years is just shy of 30, 33,000 days. What is 33,000 days, hear me, to the ancient of days? It is nothing. Hugh Hefner died at 91 years of age. His 91 years on this earth, while he flanned, fanned the flames of lust around the world, listen, when he died, he opened his eyes in the flames that will never be quenched. Jeffrey Epstein lived a paltry 66 years on this earth and tormented who knows how many young ladies. And when he died, he began receiving in himself that just recompense of his reward. Adolf Hitler lived 56 short years on this earth, and when he died, he split hell wide open. The only thing that these three men have to look forward to is the great white throne judgment, and then a worse time in the lake of fire after that. These men, these monuments to wickedness, listen to me, they were all cut down as the grass. They were nothing to God. And in the end, the evil man's life, think about it, it is not something to be envied. He actually is to be pitied Amen. because that 
evil man has done nothing but heap coals and coals upon, of God's wrath upon himself that he will one day pay for. Think about this. The greatest heaven that Hugh Hefner ever had was on this earth. What a terrible heaven. What a terrible heaven. And he will be in the flames of hell for all of eternity. It's not that I want that on anybody. I'm simply saying the Bible will always be true. Evil men will always be cut down soon. So verses 1 and 2, it shows us the problem. David shows us the problem that we fret against evildoers. We fret because of ourselves. We fret because of how wicked people live. He tells us in verse 2 that, listen, they'll be cut down. But starting in verse 3, he gives us a solution. He gives us God's game plan. David gives us five ingredients to overcome the fretting that you face. And I would encourage uh, young men who are preacher boys or people that might want to speak publicly... Listen, the Bible is full of outlines, and this is a great outline. Five ingredients that God gives right out of the scriptures as to how we can overcome the fretting in our lives. Now, the Bible gives five ingredients. Think about this. I have a hammer here. Can I swing this hammer with one finger? No. Can I swing it with two? I, I probably can't be useful with it. I might be able to throw it with two, but I can't be useful with it. The more fingers that I place on this hammer, I can really do some good work with this hammer. I've hammered thousands and thousands of nails. I know that I can hold things with my index finger out and my thumb slightly curved and still hit pretty well. But honestly, if I don't have my pinky on it, I can't swing as well with, with my pinky off of it as I can with it. You say, what's your point? My point is I have five fingers that hold this hammer. And if I really want to utilize this hammer well, I have to put all five fingers on it. All five fingers are individually separate, but they work together. They're similar. Here's my point. They're similar, but still distinct. These ingredients, they sound similar, but they are distinct and must work together to truly come to the point where God wants us in our lives to overcome that fretting. Let's look at these five ingredients. The Bible says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. And so shalt, thou trust, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Notice what it says, trust in the Lord. To trust in the Lord means to believe. To trust means to have faith. Now, how do you learn to trust something? Well, a couple of things. First, in order to trust something, you must assess the situation and evaluate your options as to where to place your trust. The Bible says we all have a measure of faith. We all have a measurement of faith that we can place in something. For instance, if I'm uh, on a shore of a lake and I want to go across the lake and there's a boat there in front of me, intellectually, I can tell you that that boat will hold me. I have a measure of faith when I look at that boat, I say, yeah, that, that boat will help me. That, that boat will hold me. That boat will get me across the lake. But I have not placed my faith in that boat until I what? Till I get in the boat. I understand intellectually that the boat will hold me, but I have not placed my measure of faith in that boat until I get in that boat. That's what happens when you get saved. You can intellectually understand that Christ wants to save you, that you need to be saved, and that Christ is the only way to get to heaven. But you will not be saved until you place your faith in Jesus Christ. Many people will go to hell knowing the way of salvation because they didn't want to truly put their faith in Christ. So how do we trust something? We assess the situation, and then we place our faith in the object for our safety. And that's what you did when you got saved. So there's two ways that we can trust the Lord. We can trust the Lord for our salvation. We evaluate our options for eternity, and we either trust ourselves and potentially go to hell or trust God and his word, put our faith in Christ, and he takes us to heaven. I did that when I was 11 years old. I placed my trust in Jesus Christ to take me to heaven. That's trust for salvation. But there's an entirely different way that we trust God, and that's for our everyday life. Do you trust God in your everyday life? And you might quickly just say, well, yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. How do you trust the Lord? What did you do today that trust, that where you purposely trusted God in a situation. Well, yeah, I do that all the time. No, 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 no. 
in a very practical way. People, church people say this, oh, I just trust the Lord with that. And I'm always like, okay, what does that even mean? Like, how do I, okay, that sounds great. It sounds biblical. It sounds religious. What does that mean? How do I, like, how do I trust you? Like, you just scratch your head and you walk away thinking, oh, that sounds good. I guess, I, I don't know. I've done, I, I did that for years. So specifically today, did you trust the Lord? And, and I'm going to go through just some short little things about how we can know that we can trust the Lord. Because most of us, I would submit to you, most of us go through day by day, and we probably don't trust God as much as we really think that we are. Why do I say that? We live in the most wealthy country in, in the world. How much trust did it really take for you to get up and go to work today? How much trust did it really take for you to write out your bills today? Most of the people in here, we have enough money in our checking account. Most of the people in here, we have enough gifts and abilities to keep our lives going without God. Unsaved people do it all the time. And so my question is, if you are a mom and you stay home and raise kids, and you have unsaved friends and their mothers as well, and they stay home and raise kids, here's my question. What is the difference in your day-to-day -day lives that causes you to say that you're actually trusting God for your day, when that unsaved mom goes through the same day, does the same types of things, and, and she's unsaved, so she can't even biblically really be trusting God. How does your day differ from hers? You're in the workforce. There are unsaved people that can do your job just as well, sometimes better. So what makes me think or what makes you think that you're actually trusting God in your practical day-to-day -day life when an unsaved person can do your job just as good or better. Listen, if your day-to-day -day life looks just like the life of an unsaved person, can you really say that you're trusting God with anything? Here's the difference. Between you and your unsaved colleague, the difference is found in how you approach to your day. For instance, mom, did you get up before the kids this morning and pray for them? There's a good chance your unsaved uh, colleague down the street, that other mother, she may or may not have. But listen, if she prayed for her kids, I guarantee you they didn't have, if she's unsaved, she didn't have the access to God that you had. Amen. If you did, Listen, mom, if you didn't pray for your kids today, and, and probably every mother does, then you can't say you trusted the Lord today. It, l l sir, uh, ma'am, through the workforce, uh, this morning, if your job didn't look anything different than an unsafe person doing the same exact job, how can you say that you trusted the Lord? For instance, before that meeting today, did you ask God to help you in that meeting? Or did you just go in there in your own strength, conducted a perfectly good meeting on your abilities, and really, quite frankly, didn't need the Lord that much? That's what I'm saying on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you trusting God? Listen, if God placed the earth at the exact point in our universe from the sun so that we wouldn't freeze or burn, and he tilted it at just the right axis and spun it at the exact correct speed to make sure that the gravitational pull was perfect, I'm pretty sure that God could handle whatever your day threw at it today. See, we trust God to keep the universe in orbit but sometimes we go through our day thinking we have to handle everything. And we do it without recognizing. Nobody wakes up and says, all right, God, I'm saved. I'm not trusting you today. Nobody does that. What do we do? We just get up and go about our day without God being even a thought in our mind. And that is how we're not trusting God. I asked a teenager yesterday. We were working out at Miss Cheryl's, and they, he had asked me what I was preaching. And I told him, and I said, I said, what did you trust God for today? And he said, when I went to work, I prayed for safety on the road. And I said, amen. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So, sir, does an 18-year-old who prays for safety on the road, does he have more trust in, uh, in, in his day than you did? I guarantee you a whole lot of men here that we didn't pray for safety on the road, and he did. That, that's the practical way that I'm talking. Do you go throughout your day 
asking the Lord to help you on projects and meetings and situations in, in relationships, whatever it might be. If you're not trusting in God, you are simply trusting in the abilities that God gave you, and that is how you made it through your day. Do you ever wonder why you get to the end of your day just frustrated and on edge and irritable? It's probably because you have exhausted your own abilities and haven't really been relying on the Lord like you should have. And then you go home and take it out on people at home. That is not not trusting the Lord. Now, I'll say this and move on regarding trust. Not only should we trust the Lord with our day-to-day -day activities, I'll say this and move on. There's people in here, you have not trusted the Lord with your past. And here's what I mean by that. Good past or not, your past is a part of who you are. And so to trust the Lord with your past means that you're trusting him to take that aspect of your life and use it as a part of the recipe for your future to bring about his perfect will in your life. Amen. And if you don't do that, you will be nothing but bitter or take for granted your, the, the idea that you have of your past. Listen, sometimes other people's sins affect your past. Sometimes your sins affect your past. You got to trust the Lord with that and move on. Amen. Trust that he's going to take that and use that for his glory. Trust the Lord. Are you, the first ingredient, are you trusting the Lord? Second ingredient, verse number four. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, many people have this verse committed to memory. Most people don't know the context of this, but this sounds cool, so we memorize it. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The second ingredient is to delight yourself in the Lord. You say, what's delight? To delight means you have a high degree of pleasure. This is the second ingredient to have a high degree of pleasure. The Bible says in the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Does God himself give you a high degree of pleasure? Don't miss this. Or does what God give you gives you a high degree of pleasure? You see, one of the things I teach my kids is we care more about the giver than the gift. A lot of times as adults, we miss this. Listen, the gift is fun. I, I like gifts. I really do. Feel free to give me some after church. <laughs> but the giver is more important. Amen. And that's the same with adults. You, you like the money that God gives you. You delight in that. Do you delight in God? You like the abilities that God gives you. That's great. Do you delight in God? You delight in the family that God gave you. Great. Do you delight in God? Delight thyself also in the Lord. Is God, think about this, is God pleasurable to you? Do you enjoy spending time with him? Do you ever get up from your Bible uh, reading in the morning and just think, man, that was good? Amen. And honestly, three days later, you don't really remember the thing that you learned three days ago, but you just remember thinking, man, that was just good. I enjoyed that. Delighting in the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm number one that a righteous man's delight is in the law of the Lord. Do you delight in the Bible? The Bible says in Psalm 40, I delight to do thy will, O God. Do you delight in God's calling on your life, God's will for your life? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter one that scorners delight in scorning. What you say, what's that mean? A scorner delights in scorning means not only do they do wrong, they make fun of those who do right. That's what that means. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2 that evil men delight in frowardness, in the frowardness of the wicked. You say, what's frowardness? Frowardness is disobedience. Frowardness is perverse behavior. Frowardness is refusal to comply. Do you delight in God, his word, and his will? Or do you delight in evil? Today, what did you delight in? This morning, did you read your Bible? Or was it too much of a burden to you and you didn't delight in it? Did you delight in God's will for your life today? Did you delight in the law of God? Listen, you might delight in something that's really neither good nor bad. Maybe your work or house or car, or your money, your family, whatever it might be. But understand something. The Bible says for the recipe that God wants you to have, you must delight in God. That's literally right out of the Bible. The second recipe to have a blessed life is to delight thyself also in the Lord. So trust the Lord, delight in the Lord. 
Ingredient number three, found in verse five. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Verse five says, to commit thy way unto the Lord. To commit sort of means, it gives the idea of giving up, right? To, to commit means to give over to. Commit means to give up or to cast your burden upon. And, and again, I said these were sometimes similar but still distinctly different. Do you, do you commit yourself to the Lord? Do you allow God to work in your life? Notice what it says in verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. If you have committed your situation, your life, your day, your kids, whatever it might be, if you've committed those things to the Lord, are you giving God enough time to work things out in your life? The Bible says he'll bring it to pass. In fact, the Bible says uh, in verse 5, he shall bring it to pass. It doesn't even say he will bring it to pass. When he says it shall bring it to pass, that's of a stronger word than the word will. To, when he says it shall bring it to pass, that means unequivocally nothing will stop this from coming true. And to commit yourself to the Lord, you must give him time to work. Are you giving him time to work? You've committed a situation to the Lord. Great. Are you giving him time to work? Remember who God is and who we are. All right. He doesn't work on our time frame. We work on his. And so when we commit something to the Lord, we must be giving him enough time to work. Are you trusting in him? Are you delighting in him? Are you committing yourself to him? Notice what the Bible says as a fourth ingredient in verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Notice in verse 7, rest in the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you have a peaceful calmness in your spirit? Is your spirit a calm spirit? Or do you have a hurried spirit? I didn't say a busy spirit. There's nothing wrong with being busy. I, I didn't say, uh, do you have a high, uh, dil, uh, a, a high level of diligence in your spirit? Nothing wrong with that. But do you have a calm spirit? Do you have a restful spirit? I think she's in the nursery, so I'll say this. Uh, five years ago, Brother Kerry went to heaven, and he died on a Wednesday. And uh, we were in the old auditorium. I was still a youth leader. And that Sunday night, after Brother Kerry passed away, uh, we go around shaking hands, and Miss Cheryl comes down to the youth section to shake hands. And, and I was like, just the way she came down to shake hands, with the joy in her face, I get sometimes you got to put on your ministry face. I get that. But this wasn't a ministry face. This was a face of, wow, I'm going to be like her one day. It, like, it, it was one of those times where, man, your husband of decades just went to heaven. And, and you, you have a restful countenance about you. She was smiling. She was happy to be there, shaking hands. I remember uh, Josh Miller and I met eyes, and we were like, you know, kind of like, man, I want to be like that one day. It was restful. It was peaceful. Are you resting in God? In this moment, right now, is your spirit troubled? Or are you restful? The Bible says in verse 7, rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. That's the fourth ingredient. The fifth ingredient, and I'm glad this is last because this is the one I really struggle with. Bible says in verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Notice he says in verse 8, cease from anger. Now here's what it seems like to me. In verse 3, he says, trust in the Lord. Verse 4, he says, delight in the Lord. Verse 5, commit thy way to the Lord. Verse 7, rest in the Lord. And it seems like verse 8, if, if you get the first four, do you know what will probably happen and kind of fall into place? Verse 8. Well, you'll just naturally learn to cease from anger. That's how this recipe works. You get one down, and two might not immediately follow, but it'll follow. You get one and two down, and three might not be right around the corner, but it's coming. You get one, two, and three down, and four, it's going to show up. You get one, two, three, and four down, and eventually, number five is going to get there. 
Number five is verse eight, cease from anger, forsake wrath. Now, maybe you're not like this, but this is one of my natural sins. I, man, I can, man, I can easily get angry. I think this is one of the major sins of most men. And do you know why we get angry? It's actually right here in the Bible, in principle. We get angry because we're not doing the first four. That's literally why we get angry. We're not trusting the Lord. We're not delighting in the Lord. We're not committing our way to the Lord. And we're not resting in the Lord. Therefore, we have taken our lives in our own hands and we get angry. That's what happens. You mark it down. You add trusting, delighting, committing, and resting yourself toward the Lord, and you will naturally begin ceasing from anger. You might still get angry from time to time, but you will be trending in that direction of ceasing from anger. Let me ask you a question. Do you still blow up all the time? How often do you lose your temper? Well, you know, Brother Joe, I don't lose my temper, but maybe once a week. Really? Really? Once a week? You think that's okay, huh? I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. Well, Brother Joe, I only lose my temper once a month. Let me ask you a question. Would you move next to a power plant that was known for blowing its top only once a month? Nobody would do that. Why? Because you'd walk around on eggshells not knowing when that power plant was about to blow. And that's exactly how people are in your house. They walk around on eggshells because of your pride and your refusal to do the first four. So you blow your stack at any moment and your kids, your wife, your husband, they never know when the next tantrum is going to happen because you're two. You haven't done the first four, therefore you haven't ceased from anger. Great, the power plant only blows once a month. What about the other 29 days out of the month where who knows what's going to happen? So the fifth ingredient is to simply cease from anger. Now, the overarching thought here is very simple. David gives us the problem in verses 1 and 2, but then he gives us the solution. And tonight, just for study purposes, we've separated them. But understand something. In a very practical way, just like the hammer, these things all work together. You trust the Lord. You delight in the Lord. You rest in the Lord. You cease from anger. And what was the last one? You commit thy way to the Lord. These five, yes, they're separate and distinct, but they're designed to work together to help you overcome the problem of verses 1 and 2. Right now, tonight, are you a fretter or are you a truster? Are you a fretter or are you a rester? Are you a fretter or are you somebody that delights in the Lord? Are you a fretter or are you angry? At any given moment, you, you are only either one of these or the other. And David had his own issues with sin. We all know that. He got angry, man. He wanted to kill Nabal just because, you know, he was, he was disrespectful to some of David's friends. He had an issue with anger. He had an issue with lust. He had all types of issues. But when David figured out this solution in life, man, I'm glad he wrote it down for us. David was an old man when he wrote this down. And David had a unique perspective on God and how God handled him in life. And David, later on in this psalm, he said something that really has helped me through the years. Remember, David's an old man. How do I know that? The Bible says in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And by now, he had already done this, this game plan, this recipe of these five things. So his steps were being ordered. The Bible says in verse 23, he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, and David knew about falling, he should not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Notice what David says in verse 25. He says, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Listen, I'm not a young man anymore. Somebody the other month called me middle-aged. I'm not quite old yet, but I'm trending in that direction. And over the last 45 years of life, and 35 years of being saved, I can tell you one thing. I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. My problems in my life are when I fall into the trap of verses 1 and 2. I fret. I get frustrated. I get angry. I worry. 
worry about my kids, my wife, my future, whatever it might be. What kind of country are we going to have? What kind of church are we going to have? And then I find verses 3 through 10, and God says, here, here, here's the game plan. Here's the recipe. Trust me. Delight in me. Rest in me. Commit your works to me. Stop being angry, and everything's going to be all right. Amen. Brother Wally.